we're finally back with part seven of our budget SP08 tool changer project. And guess what? It's finally changing tools and even printing. I didn't quite get this finished before Silksong, but I'm still on track to at least beat GTA 6. I can only apologise for the huge delays, which I explained in a recent video about my Excel. In short, no space and very limited time now that I'm part-time teaching again. But we've just had two weeks of school holidays, which has given me the time to push through with the help of the Stealth Changer team and get it to this point. Remember, these videos are a build log, not a guide for you to follow that will come later upon release. This instalment starts by correcting an error from the previous one, and that's that the printer could no longer home due to the head being in a different position with the mechanism in place. The gantry was bottoming out before the ABL sensor could trigger. If only the bed sat a little bit higher, then everything would work as it should. So that's exactly the change that I made, unbolting the bed and designing these simple 12mm spaces that prop the bed up the right amount. The bed assembly is secured with M4 by 50mm bolts, and despite the lift, we still have our full range of motion and haven't lost any Z height. I also designed an extension for the nozzle pressure sensor and scrubber, but the tool changer moves the tool forward far enough that they no longer reach, so this was a waste of time. My next update was to the bird's nest holder, where the piano wire that supports the umbilical was wedged into the mount, meaning you had to undo the whole row to pull out a single tool. So I redesigned the piano wire clamping so they're all individual and can be unplugged one at a time. This new revision will use slightly more threaded inserts, but once the piano wire is clamped into the little part, it's a whole lot easier to add and remove tools if you need to work on them. And now's a good time to mention that you shouldn't hot swap these while the printer's powered up as I managed to kill one. The second one I killed I'll explain soon. This small plug is also easier to modify for those that want to run something besides piano wire. So a little bit of reprinting and assembly for me, but more user friendly and extensible for others. Another little user-friendly update I've done are to these cow locks that hold the flimsy injection molded part in place on the tool which is essential for clean docking. Despite my best efforts to press them firmly into position, they would frequently still fall out of position as I was putting the cover back on and this was quite frustrating and clumsy. So I modelled some different variations and after printing and testing them, settled on the version that uses self-tapping screws. This makes the tool cover marginally wider and the tiniest bit heavier, but once screwed into position, they are rock solid. Most importantly, this iteration turns a frustrating task into one that's repeatable and reliable. No longer little bits falling off, we just align everything and put in the bolts to pull it all tight. Next, some wiring. And in the last video, we discussed how the tap sensor would be triggered when the tool was attached to the shuttle, and therefore the firmware would know which tool was attached. We need one tap sensor per tool, and I specifically went for this mellow version because it's 24 volt tolerant and that makes the wiring easier. The back of the sensor is labeled for positive ground and signal and the Sovol wiki has the pinouts for the BL touch port. Here's what I've ended up with. It's reliable, so let's explain how we get there. Each sensor will come with some parts for wiring. This includes a JST PH connector and some pre-terminated wires that will go straight into that housing. We start by plugging them in to match what's written on the PCB. If we bring those wires around to the other side, we can see that they're just not long enough to reach the BL touch port, but they also have the incorrect pins on the end for this plug. This BL touch port is a lot smaller, being JSTZH, but rather than buying a crimping kit for that, we can use the exact same connector on our spare fans that we removed earlier. This connector can be plugged straight in to the three most pins on the left. The fan end of the loom cut off, and then the two sets of wires soldered together you'll end up with a hybrid cable around 16 centimeters long. And on the smaller end, it's vitally important to use a pick to release the connector and pull out the red and black pins so we can switch them over. If you forget to do this, you're going to let the magic smoke out on the tap sensor and maybe destroy the SV08 tool as well. Trust me, I found this out firsthand for one of my tools. Hopefully now with this explanation, this diagram now makes sense. And like I said, if you follow it carefully, this has been very reliable. Once the cable is made up, there is just enough room to pass it through the backing plate directly underneath the existing stepper motor cable. If both of them sit flat, they can go on top of each other and not be pinched and at risk of damage. Some important groundwork done, but now onto the main event, installing the Clipper Tool Changer plugin. 
Honestly, this was a huge slog, but the plan is to release an SD card image with everything you're about to see done to make your life as easy as possible. As part of the draft shift collection on GitHub, we have a repo called Clipper add-on for tool changing, and it is labeled early alpha, not for general use. And it is important to acknowledge that all of this has been built on the work of Viesta Zarens, who created the original Clipper tool changer plugin. So what exactly is this and why do we need it? Well, Clipper does not support tool changing by default. So to help this, we have a bunch of Python files that add additional functionality, and then a series of additional configuration files for setting up and tuning the tool changer actions. Finally, we have an installation script to make it as easy as possible to install this. Because this is not yet complete, some of the documentation can be hard to follow. In fact, to find some of it, we need to come back to the Stealth Changer repo and check out the wiki. And one thing that did catch me out were these pages being in alphabetical order instead of the order that you need to complete them. So if you are following along and doing the step by step, come to the checklist page and do things in that order. Because I was worried about breaking things and having to start from scratch, I frequently powered down the printer and made a backup image of the SD card. This was a safety net for me, but will make your life much easier if you're following on later on. The advice given to me from the Stealth Changer guys was to get the Tool Changer plugin working for a single tool and then add more one by one. With this in mind, I commenced by starting with the installation script found on the GitHub page. This step was very quick, but now the real work could begin. Because a bunch of new files have been added, but they didn't have the correct configuration to suit the SV08. So in several configuration files, I had to comb through and transport over the right pen definitions to suit. This was made harder by the fact that I had my own formatting and layout for the original files compared to the new ones. So for maximum safety, after I had copied over relevant values to suit SV08, I commented those lines in my original config to keep track and keep a backup reference. After that, I followed the instructions to add references to the new files in my main printer.configuration file. There was a lot of little steps here and inevitable typos made things trickier as I went. After that was done, then we got to the head scratches and most of these were caused by the same compatibility issue. Previously, I installed mainline Clipper using this excellent guide that installed the basic Clipper files, but also some additional ones specific to the SV08 that Sovol had developed. And then of course, we have the custom files to help the tool changing from the new plugin. And as you might've guessed, some of these files clashed with each other. So with the assistance of the guys from DraftShift, I was able to inspect the files, see which ones were needed and which ones could now be deleted to clear the conflicts. Eventually, after a lot of mucking around, Clipper would finally boot up without any complaints and thus began the process of prepping for a single color print to show that everything was working. And the first task was setting the Z offset for the new tap sensor probing. As you can see, it's triggered when the carriage moves down enough to dislodge the tool. I homed the printer and ran the standard paper test using the probe calibrate macro. And although this was automatically saved to the bottom of the printer configuration, it seemed to be ignored and that's because the tool changer requires a different setup. Each individual tool has its own Z offset, so you have to copy and paste the value into the appropriate section for that tool's configuration. Around this time, I also calibrated things like the PID for the hot end and did automatic input shaping tuning using the onboard accelerometer. I also followed the guide on the wiki to set up Orca Slicer with the correct start machine G-code so I could finally attempt my first single color print. And this is where I found more clashes between the factory macro file, some of the added tool changer macros, and the Sobol macros file. So I took the time to work out which ones to keep and commented out the others. We found a small bug with the tool changer homing sequence that was fortunately easy to fix and remembered that the old nozzle brush could no longer be reached. So I had to make a modified bed spacer at the front right, peeling off the old nozzle scrubber silicon, installing it here instead, and reconfiguring the nozzle cleaning macro to suit the new coordinates. Around this time, I was tweaking the coordinates for quad gantry leveling and unfortunately discovered an annoying problem. Sometimes during probing in the corners, the shuttle was sometimes hitting the bed before the tap sensor could trigger, causing a firmware error. This prompted a tiny modification to the shuttle to make the sensor trigger at a different place. We then need a reprint, hardware transfer, and then installation onto the SV08, which with this shuttle design doesn't require removing any belt tension, which is one good thing at least. And this modification had the intended effect with around a millimeter of space underneath the bottom of the shuttle at the point that the tap sensor triggered. But of course, that meant calibrating the Z offset once again. And then finally, printing something with a single tool and the Clipper Tool Changer plugin in place and set up. 
humble beginnings, but still an important step in the journey. In hindsight, what you just saw was the easy bit because the next step was setting up and calibrating the actual tool changes. And a big thank you once again to the patient help from the Stealth Changer team. Job one was to duplicate the configuration files for each tool. The pins remain the same for each one, but obviously you need to change things like the MCU serial and increment the tool and extruder number by one for each time. Search and replace was pretty handy for this. And then we start to calibrate the positions for the dock parking. This involved homing the printer, running quad gantry leveling, putting all of the tools back on the rack, and then manually moving the empty shuttle into the exact location that it needs to be to pick up that tool. Visibility is hard and it's slow going, but once you're confident you have a position where you can raise and lower Z by one millimeter to engage and disengage the tap sensor, you can note those coordinates and save them to the config for that tool. We also need measurements like safe Y, which dictates how clear of the tool rack the gantry needs to be to avoid any collisions. These additional values then get saved into the tool changer configuration file. So how did my first tool change go? Well, very bad actually. Instead of moving to the safe wire distance clear of the tools, the gantry traveled straight up to the underside and smashed into the rack. I set up the camera from a different angle and started the sequence again, this time with my finger over the e-stop. Another attempt, another collision about to happen. We worked out there was a step that had been missed, missing from the readme on the installation page, but elsewhere on the main stealth changer repo was an example printer configuration file with some sections that needed to be added, and the important one that I was missing was the rounded path function. With this in place, the next attempt unfortunately didn't fare any better. There was a strange jerky movement right at the beginning, and at the top the safe wire was being respected, but the X alignment was way off, followed by this smackdown. These are the embarrassing moments where you struggle to find the power switch and you realize you should have had your finger on the e-stop button. We worked out that the acceleration for the SPO8 was set way too high and that quick jerky movement was steps being skipped. With the overall acceleration and also the feed rates for the tool changing sequence being lowered, we can see the rounded path G0 movement in action. From the homing position, we have a nice curvy path up to the top and this time we actually got pretty close to dumping the tool in the correct position. Ultimately, the placement was a tad too shallow for the Y axis, causing the tool to not catch on the rack cleanly and a hand being required to prevent another drop. What followed was almost a week of fine tuning and adjustment, tweaking the XYZ coordinates for each tool to get the docking spot on, some custom parameters to suit the SP08 as suggested by the Stealth Changer guys, and another very minor revision to this top section that triggers the tap sensor to make the coupling more reliable. And the combined sum of all of that work took the tool changes from being quite unreliable to what I would call reliable and repeatable. It did take a lot of effort, but currently it's to the point where I haven't had a failure of a tool change in some time. Getting this far is satisfying, but it's not quite perfect and there's a single simple reason behind that. This is how my umbilicals looked at the end of part six. And this is how the piano wire has sagged and they now sit. We can learn from the Prusa XL here that has these wide flat strips to support the umbilical. These bend easily from front to back but their width means they don't really like bending from side to side very much, which is why they remain upright after quite a lot of time. Apparently piano wire is fine on a smaller printer, but this amount of play on a large one manifests as dimensional variation as to where the tools sit inside the dock. This flat coil has been recommended as an alternative to piano wire. It should bend in the Y axis, but not really move that much for X. I've ordered some and it will update my CAD when it comes. In the meantime, I designed this wedge to slot in between the individual docks, so the tool as it's dropped off will be gently pushed into a squarer resting position. Although crude, this solution did prove to be quite effective and significantly cut down the amount of jiggle and play the tools had when sitting in the dock, leading to more consistent tool changes. Since the large one was too big to print on an SVO8, I switched to this smaller modular version these optionally replace an existing link between the docks for those wanting their tools to sit a little more snugly. Previously, I promised that in this installment, we would finally be printing. So let's do that and then evaluate where the SV08 project is currently at. I started really simply with this DSE calibration model designed to test the alignment on dual color prints. Orca Slicer prepared the print using T1, which is the second extruder from the left. And I held my breath as that segment finished and I watched the printer climb to the top to change the tool. By the way, these values are still slowed down from troubleshooting and I have increased them reliably since. This setup will always have slower changes than something like an XL, but they will at least be much faster than what you're seeing here. 
but change after change, the previous tool was parked nicely in the dock and the new one was picked up without any errors. Despite this being a simple print, this was very gratifying to see the thing actually working. And this reliability continued throughout the print until I made a mistake, trying to bend an umbilical cable straight and accidentally unplugging one of the cables. As a rough proof of concept, it's job done. But this print also points to the first step that's required for part eight of this series, because so far I have not calibrated any offsets between the various tools. The Excel has an automated sequence where each tool is touched against a probe to measure the subtle differences in each of their positions. I've already purchased the cheap equivalent to do this on the SV08, which is questionably titled the Sex Ball Probe. Once this is used in the next video, the misalignment between the various nozzles will go away and that will help deliver greatly improved results. I also need to wire up the filament runout sensors and probably evict this spider too. Given the timeline has blown out, the question begs, is this SV08 tool changer project still relevant given the new competition? The Prusa XL is still available as an alternative, but now we also have the Bamboo Lab H2C on the way with its Voltec hot end changing system, Index by Bontech, a nozzle changing system that can be retrofitted to other 3D printers, and the much more affordable Snapmaker U1 tool changer. I think for value, this looks to be the best option, but it is limited to only four tool heads and a build volume of 270 millimeters cubed. The SV08 has the advantage here. Even with our changes, it still has a build volume of 355 by 340 by 347 millimeters. And best of all, it can have up to six tools, which is very competitive. And our pricing, which only needs the six ball probe added for a few dollars, is still very competitive. Obviously, there'll be a fair amount of time that goes into building this, but a lot of people, including myself, quite like doing this as a project. This step, in my mind at least, was always going to be the biggest hurdle, so I'm quite relieved to have it done. And I am on a roll, so hopefully it won't be anywhere near as long until the next part comes out. A huge thanks once again to Justin, Thomas and Chris for all of their assistance thus far. A big thank you to you as well for watching and for your patience. Until next time, happy Tool Changer 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.